Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Well, welcome to the show. If, if, uh, if you hadn't noticed yet, we do have a, a special guest today, Mr. Gordon Whittington. Um, he's the editor emeritus at North American Whitetail, which I'm sure everybody uh, recognizes your face, Gordon. Uh, but. Well, I I, uh, I would hope so by this point. It's been a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, plenty of opportunities for them to see it. <laughs> no, that's great. We we appreciate you uh, getting on with us tonight. We have uh, we have a lot to talk about, so um, we might as well get started. Um, but before we start, everybody, if you have questions for Gordon, just leave them in the comment section, and I'll try to filter through them kind of as we go. And at the end, maybe we'll answer. Uh, a few of them for everybody. Um, anyways, Gordon, uh, before we kind of dive into the topics, we were going to have you kind of just give an overview of uh, who you are and um, kind of how you got involved at North American Whitetail. Well, it, it truly is a long story. Now, I just turned 67, so I'm, I'm not going to cover every year, but, but it almost goes back to the very beginning, really, I was a kid in grade school and I was, I grew up on a cattle ranch in central Texas in the hill country, which in the sixties and seventies, when a lot of other places didn't have many deer, we had a hundred and something deer per square mile. I mean, we had deer everywhere. Now they're small, mm -hmm. but we had a lot of them. So I started deer hunting when going with my grandpa when I was five, I killed my first deer. It was a doe when I was seven. I went on through high school, um, you know, just hunting as much as I could and fishing as well. And and I found out, you know, I figured out when I was a kid, really, probably in grade school, I thought, God, I'm pretty good at writing. I, I can't add two and two, but I can, I think I can write. So that kind of merged with my just innate interest or passion, if you will, for the outdoors. And so op opportunity came along. I guess you could say you make your own opportunity, but, you know, you have to be blessed to have chances. And um, I won state as a feature writer uh, in high school. Uh, I had 23 kids in my high school class and was competing against all schools in Texas, and I, and I was able to win the feature writing contest. So hmm. that told me that, you know, maybe I had a future in it. So I went to college, majored in journalism, University of Texas, got out of there, late 70s. I went to work for a couple of newspapers, just getting my feet wet in, in, in the professional world. And then I worked, went to work editing Texas Sportsman magazine in Dallas, really small little magazine, but the people who owned it sold it within a year to the people who were in the process of founding North American Whitetail. Now, that was just one of those things where, you know, everything just coalesced into an opportunity you could never really maybe count on. Uh, but I got there in 1984 to start working for them full time. Uh, they'd already been out for about a year and a half at that point. And so by the end of 84, I was actually editing the magazine for them. Uh, that was over here in the Atlanta area. And uh, after that, it just North American whitetail kept growing and I just kept riding the horse, you know. And so it's almost, I think, 36 and a half years before I finally hung it up uh, in early 2021. And in the meantime, of course, editing the magazine, but also producing TV, working on the TV show, uh, a lot of other things, too. It just and a whole lot of hunting, obviously, too. So it, it all just kind of turned into this dream scenario that I didn't know was going to be the case when I was a kid thinking I, maybe I could be an outdoor writer. And at the time, you know, there weren't any deer only magazines. There weren't any bass magazines. It was all the big three. Right. And so. You just kind of thought, well, maybe I can be a general outdoor writer like some of the guys that I looked up to, but it turned in a different direction. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, um, when I was young and, and uh, North American Whitetail came out, I remember how crazy it was when, when, when I found that magazine and saw the, uh, the bucks that were in there and uh, the featured articles. And you weren't seeing that stuff. You know, you'd hear about one or two of those bucks or throughout the whole year, you'd hear about most of them. But all of a sudden, all they were, they were all right there, and you didn't have to filter through bass fishing and squirrel hunting and quails <laughs> to find it. And uh, it really was kind of like a, a historic thing because, uh, um, I mean, this goes behind on your time, Josh, but in that day when that came out, everybody was talking about it. It was the biggest thing out there. And it was all we had for media in those days for people that were really into big bucks. 
Yeah, to be honest with you, uh, I mean, it was an experiment for sure. These guys didn't know this was going to work. In fact, David Morris, you know, who's a great hunter and and, and certainly a, a respected person in the industry, he hired me to work at North American Whitetail. And he told me later, he said, we put out the first one. He said, we didn't know if there'd be a second one. We didn't know. <laughs> there, was, there was no, now it seems silly now, right, to say, oh, this iconic brand, you didn't think there was enough people interested to even, even maybe put out a second issue. But uh, at the time, there wasn't anything to go on. I mean, you said, well, people seem to like the deer hunt, and there's a lot of people that buy licenses, and 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 we're crazy about big deer, so maybe somebody else is. And that was their attitude. He and Steve Vaughn, the publisher, they they were kind of the 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 real roots, if you will, of the brand. And uh, you know, it just took off. I mean, I don't know how you could predict that. That thing happens if you're lucky once in a lifetime, and I and I was blessed to have it happen. The Did timing you, uh, of it was perfect. Yeah. That's what that's what hit it. You know, you hit it at the time when deer hunting just started to boom and there was nothing else out there. Yeah, you know, the first issue of North American Whitetail came out about a year after the Missouri Monarch was found dead. And that was the big news, you know, within the general outdoor media it was like, oh, this monster buck is going to be a new world record. Well, then. In the process, of course, they discovered the hole in the horn buck in Ohio in a bar, and and then then things started to just exponentially accelerate. It's just like there were so many big deer from so many years, not just the Jordan buck or the Breen buck, but or the hole in the horn, but so many other big deer that um, had already been killed that you, it took a while to even begin to catch up on on featuring those deer. And then, of course, like you say, Dan, you had this was the start of this big wave where every deer herd was growing rapidly. The guys that were really good hunters could, you know, maybe with enough sign reading, there was no cameras, right, or anything. So with enough sign reading, enough time and enough skill um, and persistence, you know, some of these guys were able to start killing big deer regularly. And, Mm -hmm. and that was something that nobody was even trying to do back in the fifties and sixties, to my knowledge, Fred Goodwin or somebody like that, that, that kind of an obsessed, outlier if you will but for every fred goodwin there were a hundred thousand guys that just wanted to kill a buck mm-hmm. you think a north american whitetail had a, a big factor in all those big bucks kind of being discovered uh when that was all going on yeah well the thing is dick idol who everybody says oh gee that <clears throat> that sounds like a made-up name <laughs> but but it's, it's <laughs> richard idol and he goes by dick so i mean you know yeah. that's uh that, that, that's dick but he uh he was so instrumental in all this because he also helped to found North American whitetail. And part of what happened was David and Steve got introduced to Dick and Dick was starting to collect all these giant heads. Mm -hmm. And he was also hunting South Texas. He was hunting Western Canada, Montana, places that nobody else at that time was traveling to for whitetail. And these guys were infatuated with that. And they said, man, if we're, if this guy's got that many big deer and he knows about all these big deer and the stories on them and good grief, look at these deer. They're incredible. Nobody sees these in real life. It's just, you know, magazine stuff, but they were real deer. And so these guys said, man, that's got to be, that's got to be of interest to other people, If they, but they don't know this stuff is out there. And so it took people like Dick, Fred Goodwin, uh, Chuck Arnold, some of these people, these early antler collectors that were obsessed with whitetails, it took them to really gather this stuff and for us to be able to tap into that. And And guys were starting to kill big deer too, but we were looking back over a century at that point of miscellaneous uh, collected heads that even though you didn't always know a lot about them, you certainly knew how big they were and you knew what they scored. And to be honest with you, there's some, there's some advantages I think to covering this old stuff because there's a mystique to something from 1920 that you don't get from 2020. You just don't get (laughs) it. And, and so I think that actually played into our hands, even though we didn't, plan it that way it turned out to be kind of a nostalgic romantic sort of a of a visit of uh, a tour of whitetail history yeah you know I was, I was a big fan of that uh of dick idols um i remember when i was younger like you said um most guys just wanted to kill a deer you know in most areas mm-hmm. and i remember his articles catching me in kind of in shock where he would uh, take a camera with him and take pictures of these giant bucks and say, well, that one will just miss Boone and Crockett. I'm not shooting that one. You know, <laughs> and uh, reading that as a young guy, wishing, wishing I could shoot a 130 inch buck. It was like, what? <laughs> you know? That was amazing. And I, I mean, people like that, 
probably instilled that in me to hold out for better bucks and to be better. And we, if we didn't have North American whitetail and we didn't have people like you and Dick Idle and those, you know, those greats from back then, um, we probably wouldn't have set our goals so high and you wouldn't have everybody else trying to achieve those things. Well, like I, 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 I agree with you because you have to know that it's even feasible or possible before you can really even seriously dream about it. You know, otherwise it's just yeah. a fantasy. It's just a total fantasy. And so, you know, the Wenzel brothers, obviously, uh, there's there's names you can pick out of the past from back there that you say, boy, the first thing I read about mock scrapes or decoys or mm -hmm. or reading rub lines with Greg Miller and some of these things, you're just like, wow, that's starting to sound like a strategy, not just a prayer. You know, that's like maybe this can actually be done. And as there got to be more deer and there got to be uh, still a lot of opportunity with access, obviously, that you don't really have now. Um, so there weren't as many big deer back then, but you had easier access to the ones that were out there. And so I think a lot of guys just went they caught the fever like all of us did at one point or where we wouldn't be here. Um, I think it, the, it, everything was coming together at one time, the information, the passion and the herd and, and the habitat. So you put all that together and it's no wonder we saw what still I believe is going to go down as the golden age of white, of big white tail. Yeah. You mentioned like uh, some of those old bucks and how they're a little bit nostalgia for people to like review back back in those days. And it's funny you said that because I was kind of going through just some of the top bucks ever, ever shot. And uh, I've always thought that Mel Johnson buck for some reason was so cool to me. And I, I always like held that one to a higher standard, but it's probably because he has like a longbow laying there next to it. And, you know, it's <laughs> it's it's it was hit, killed in the 60s, I think. Um and it, I never never thought about it that way, but that's probably why I think that buck's so cool was because it's just old and um, just something about it, you know. Well, not even that many people were trying to kill any deer with any kind of bow at that point. Longbow, yeah. you know, a recurve. I mean, I mean, I ran into a guy. This this shows you how it's all evolved. Um, a guy named Don Brasper up in Minnesota. If you go way back to the earliest days of, of the Pope and Young record book, he killed a 186 non-typical in 1959 on public land. Uh, a buddy bumped it through a cattails marsh. I mean, you'll love this, Dan. Uh, <laughs> through a cattail marsh on public, the deer ran in front of him. He just swung and shot it. I mean, he just, you know, total instinct <laughs> kills this deer. And, and then not much was made of it because it's early 1960s when the when the story would have come out. Well, nobody was covering that then. Not you know, Bowhunter magazine didn't even exist yet. You know, for another 10 years, right? So so deer like this almost got lost to history. So I you know, but when I wrote my world record whitetails book in the late 90s, I figured out that this deer had been a world record. It'd been the very first one. So I found Don. He was still living up in Minnesota at the time, and I and I talked to him about it, and he told me the story. And I said, how have things changed? He said, well, he said, man, it's, it said, it's crazy. He said, you know, all the squabbling today about high let off bows or mechanicals or lasers and, you know, all the stuff that we fight over now, cell cams, you name it. Um, he said, the funny thing was said, I, I was in an archery club back in the fifties in Minnesota. And he said, I remember when a guy came in to one of our meetings and he had taped, he had made some steel pins like for a site reference to put on his site window on his recurve and everybody says man look at that and he said there were guys right then that said if you're gonna do that you might as well shoot a rifle i mean yeah. <laughs> now can you imagine i mean you, Dan, you know what i'm saying it's like yeah. can you even imagine now what what a challenge that would have been to kill anything with it but compared to what they knew as archery that was not archery to them and so this little thing, this squabbling about high let off and crossbows and all that kind of stuff, this is nothing new. I mean, <laughs> the Indians were probably fighting over right. this, right? You know, 3,000 years ago, oh, you can't chip a point like that. That's, that's not even legal. You know, so, so I, you know, stories like that really bring it home to you sometime that nothing has really changed except the hunting's gotten better, but, but people are still <laughs> people, right? Yep. I have a, a friend that's in his, he's close to 60 now and he's never, never picked up the compound. You know, he always, he kept with his, his traditional bow. And 
we were shooting with some friends and one of them was like gap shooting. I don't know if you know what that mm-hmm. is or not, but sure. it's, it's a form of aiming for a traditional bow. And it just irritated him that he was doing that just to no end. So he was just like, if you're going to gap shoot, you might as well go ahead and pick up your compound. You know, it's, it's <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like, geez, Alan, he's still, he's still using a, a long bow, you know? Well, you know, every, every time I hear people uh, whining about crossbows nowadays, which I don't care what somebody uses, I just worry about myself. But sure. every time I hear hear all the, the complaining about the crossbows, I, I remember back to when compounds first started getting big, and a lot of people I knew being like, "Like, well, that's cheating. That's you know, you know they should only have those during gun season. They should have their own season." <laughs> <laughs> that's the same thing we're going through now with crossbows. Like you said, it's just an ongoing thing. Things change. They evolve. You know. Well, if you're not doing it the way I'm doing it, you're doing it wrong. I mean, that's 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 how guys are, right? I yeah. mean, it's the old that's Chevy humans. Chevy Ford, Matthews Hoyt, you know, yeah. Rage Rage Muzzy. I mean, we could go on and on and on, right? But right. I mean, there's there's just something about the need to tell everybody else that you're right, and and by definition, you're not always right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but there doesn't have to be a wrong as long as it's legal and safe and ethical. I don't care what you use. Right. Yeah. Um, Gordon, uh, we try to do a news article on this show, uh, every time we do it. And since we had you on, there's some kind of some rumblings going around the hunting industry at the moment about the, the Milo Hansen buck getting sold to Bass Pro. Um, let me throw, uh, my screen up here. So, um, in case people aren't familiar with the Milo Hansen buck, um, pull, pull this from, uh, North American whitetail's website here this is a picture of the milo Hansen buck and it's it's the world record not our typical measure 213 and 5 8 um we thought we'd get this up here and you told me you were the first person in the media to actually visit milo right when he after he shot this yeah and it's kind of a wild story even how how we got there uh, you know he shot it november 23rd 1993 so it's coming up on 30 years this fall um <clears throat> What happened was I was hunting in Montana, uh, western Montana, out in the middle of nowhere, some some desolate place in public land, the week that when he killed the deer. Mm -hmm. And but nobody knew it at the time. Of course, you know, no Internet, no barely had fax machines, really. I mean, you know, it was just there was no cell phones. There was no nothing like that. So and Milo didn't know what he had. So but but a guy named Jim Weeb. looked at the deer and said, look, it's going to be legit. So he's the guy that got hold of us. But what happened in the meantime? So so he killed it on November, November 23rd, which is a Tuesday. Uh, that weekend, and I'd know nothing about it, uh, that weekend I flew back to Atlanta from uh, Montana, but I'd been way up in the mountains and I've got, you know, got the bug from drinking out of a creek. I mean, you know how it is, even at 5,000 <laughs> feet in the, in the Rockies, you can't be sure you're not going to get sick. Well, I got sick on the way back and literally could not go to the office for two days once I got home. So sick, I couldn't get out of bed. Well, I finally, on Wednesday, December the 1st, so this is now eight days after he kills the deer. In the meantime, it's hanging in his grain bin on his farm without a lock on the door. That's where the deer's mm-hmm. hanging in the meantime, because he didn't know what he had. So I get into the office, crawl in there about 9.30 or 10 o'clock on that Wednesday morning, December the 1st. There's a phone call comes in to me, uh, and somebody takes it to the front desk. They hand me this note, says so-and-so says, this is so-and-so from Jim Weave from Saskatchewan, and his neighbor has killed a new world record typical. Well, we're all on go because everybody just knew the Jordan buck was going to fall, right? It's just a matter of what day or what season. So, you know, I... You know, I call the guy back and, and talking to him, I just, you know, it, it wasn't like he was showing me photos or, you know, we didn't have any text or anything. I'm talking to him on a landline from my office and I could tell that he wasn't joking that this deer sounded like it was totally legit. Now, he didn't give me any measurements, but he told me he knew it was well bigger than 210. And so 206 and 18 have been the world record since literally 1914, if you want to look at it, you know, chronologically. It had been world record for 79 years and nobody had even sniffed 210 well this deer was supposed to be easy over 210 well i went and talked to my boss steve vaughn our publisher down the hall and i said this this sounds legit he said what do you think i said i i think it's i think it's a real deal he said well we got to go so that was about 10 30 on that wednesday morning december the first by 12 30 my fiance had pulled us up to the front of hartsfield airport to get on a plane to toronto to connect to saskatoon 
And that night we were in Saskatoon at 10 o'clock the next morning, I was shaking Milo's hand uh, an hour and a half west of Saskatoon in the middle of a snow blizzard. And so that's how, that's what it took to be the first one there. Uh, I'm not saying somebody else couldn't have done it. In fact, Jim Zumbo, my good friend, you know, with Outdoor Life forever. And at the time, Jim was with Outdoor Life. And Jim had heard about this. The rumor was starting to get out, but we were the first ones to get in to see the guy. Well, Jim apparently is circling the area like a buzzard, uh, <laughs> waiting, waiting for his chance to get in. But he never got that chance because we got there at 10 o'clock that morning. At 11 o'clock that night, we left the Hanson farm with an agreement that we could be the first people to do the story. Mm. And uh, that's, and I, I literally took photo. I mean, my, there were no I never laid a tape on this deer. People say, well, what did you get when you scored him? I said, I didn't score him. Steve didn't either. We never even asked for a tape measure. The deer was lying there in a, you know, trash bag, the, the head ready to be fleshed out. It's been dead for eight days. The head's lying there in his basement. Uh, electric tape wrapped around between the G1 and 2 on the right side where, where one of his stray shots had almost snapped the beam off. But so he'd wrap tape around it to keep it from falling off. And, you know, we said later, I said, well, you know, Steve and I just knew when we left there that night, he said, well, congratulations. So we got a car, he said, congratulations, uh, you got the story of the new world record. I said, I said, yeah, we did. And we never measured the deer. We never, never looked at a score sheet, nothing, <laughs> because we didn't have to. We knew he was bigger than 206 and 18, and we just, I wasn't going to insult the guy by checking behind him. You know, I said, well, I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to score it. I don't know what he scores, but he's bigger than 206 and 18. And sure enough, he was, you know, went in at 213 and 18, I think was what his 213 and change. He ended up going up a little bit at panel to 213 and 58, and that's where he is today. Um, so, you know, people say, man, what a lucky break to get to be the first one there. And it was, I mean, we were blessed to have the opportunity, but we also then acted on it. And if you don't act on it, it's just another sad story, right? So, but that, that was a watershed moment in whitetail history. There's no doubt about it. And so I'm just thrilled for Milo now that after all these years that he's, he's able to now pass that deer off to the public after being able to enjoy it for three decades in his basement. That's, that's just the coolest thing. Yep. He, he shot that. Did it, was it on a deer drive as well, the story goes is how he ended up getting that deer? Yeah, they, they knew of the deer, but they weren't, Milo wasn't a serious trophy hunter, but that when you have a deer like that in the area, you're going to try to get him. Well, everybody was, was trying, you know, but he just happened to be the one that, that got the shot, you know, and, and put it down. Another local guy had shot at the deer, I think a week or so before up on, in, a, in the area and had, had missed him. And, you know, I talked to him later and he says, well, that's the way it goes, you know, but it's hard yeah. to imagine that you had a chance to be Milo Hansen and you weren't, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that the, the most impressive deer you ever kind of held, Gordon? Well, that's, you know, when people say, what's your favorite deer? Uh, it's still the hole in the horn buck. Um, mm. Because to me at the, you know, the mystique of that deer um, and he came along at a time that he really helped put North American whitetail on the map. Uh, but that deer, even after 40 years of drying, the rack still weighed over 11 pounds. And so as far as sheer amount of antler on a wild deer, uh, that's about as good as it's ever been, really. And there's a lot of great deer since then. There's deer, you know, that are around that score, 328 and 28s. Uh, and there's some super giants that, you know, sheds and trail cam picks and all this stuff. And we know my other monsters are out there, but as far as to have it in your hands and say, here's what I've told people. I say, here's the bottom line for me. If, and I thought this one time when I was at Bass Pro, this is 15 years ago before they had some of these other deer. And, you know, if, if suddenly the fire alarm went off and you're in the middle of this museum and people say you can grab one thing on the way out the door, but you can't grab two and you can't wait which deer would you pull off which wall i'd be hard pressed not to take this deer you know yeah. I'm, I'm not and he was never officially the world record he could have been but he wasn't he wasn't discovered in time but but that to me brings i mean you say if you only or it's the old deal if you only had one arrow if you only had one bullet and they all came out in front of you at once which one are you going to shoot i'd be yeah. hard pressed not to shoot this one right yeah just 
<laughs> yeah. He even looks like a, I mean, he looks like a different type of deer, like his body and everything, you know, just massive looking animal. Yeah. You know, they, they think he was killed by a train. I'm just curious what happened to the train. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, you so know, how, you know, uh, when you talk about how uh, a buck like that is your favorite, regardless of the score, I think, kind of, I mean, uh, obviously the score goes into it because it's so big. Sure. But if you could change something about the scoring system, would you? And if, and if you would, what? You know, the one thing I've always thought about score, and you, people get hung up on net versus gross, which totally understand that. I mean, that's the whole uh, argument about alternative systems and water displacement and, you know, all the different ways you could potentially measure a deer. I mean, to me, it comes down to what, you know, if, if you put all these deer on a wall, if you put the top 100 typicals or top 100 non-typicals all in this giant wall, and you had people had a hundred thousand whitetail hunters come in with with these little forms and they literally listed and ranked their favorites in each category from one to 100 let's just say that somewhere in the one top 100 is going to be the biggest deer right or the best deer mm -hmm. let's just assume somewhere it's kind of like football hey somewhere in the playoffs the best team right but we don't know which team well here if you said let's take that and then let's compile all the data and figure out which system out there would tend to give the deer that the public like best the highest rankings. Because that's that's really kind of in a way, uh, it, again, we're not weighing antlers, we're not, we're not water displacing antlers, we're not, we're, you know, you argue about gross versus net, uh, I appreciate however you want to measure them, but, but to me that would be, that would be the ultimate system because that would reflect what hunters want. Okay. Now, uh, some people might say, well, gee, I like chocolate antlers and I like really white antlers. Well, I'm not sure you can measure antler tone or antler color, you know, and, and come up with a scoring system. But you, you do know the totality. When you look at a big deer, you know if you love him better than another deer on the same wall. I mean, your eye just goes to it. And that's why when people say um, spread is just thin air, that is true. But I'm going to tell you what, you put a 28-inch deer a 28 inch 160 on the wall next to an 18 inch 190. And you tell me where people start going to when they walk in the room, they're all, yeah. they tend to walk toward the wide deer and, or big drop tines and, you know, different freaky things. I mean, barnacle bucks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. People, people have certain things they just are intrigued by, but people like wide deer and I've never been hung up on it myself, but if he wants to be wide, that's fine with me. OK, I, you know, I have no problem if he wants to be 24 instead of 14, you know, right. no, no matter what, no matter what's on his head. So I, I actually would. And, but I don't think anybody actually sees inside spread. I understand why you want to standardize by using inside spread of the main beams versus greatest spread. However, people look at a deer on a wall. They see the outside of the box. They don't see yep. inside the beams, especially the beams that curve way around and you can't really, I mean, that's a number and it's relevant, but if that deer lays out like this, instead of like this, then you tell me which one you'd shoot if they came out at the same time. Every, everybody would kill the wider deer if they're relatively equal. So I would come up with some way to reflect that. I don't know whether I would throw away inside spread and use greatest spread, but I think it would more accurately reflect the public's uh, interest in, uh, just the way the human eye operates. You know, I got a picture of a barn wall we took like uh, 10 or 15 years ago with a lot of my mounts behind me. And I took a portion of it and I zoomed in. And I got a 140 inch eight pointer, uh, 100 and, uh, mid 180s non typical, and a 160 inch 11 pointer, all in this little block I zoomed in on. And I put that on the internet. And uh, I did a poll. If these three came walking out, and you reminded me that with your comment, <laughs> which one would you shoot? That's and what matters, overwhelmingly, right? <laughs> overwhelmingly, people picked the 140-inch uh, eight-pointer. And when you looked at it, huh? And that's kind of why I did that study, is because, or not study, but post, is because when you looked at them, that 140 inches on that eight-pointer looked bigger 
than 15 points and at a 180 something you know mm -hmm. it was a small rack with a lot of tines you know sure um, but by eye people picked the one that had the big cage you know well i i think frame does matter i mean you know people say well that doesn't always reflect you know a deer you know some deer have a big frame but then they have stubby points or they you know uh, yeah i get it no two deer alike i don't care if they're spikes they're not totally identical i mean so so everybody's gonna and we all got to be happy with the deer we have in front of us i mean because because mm -hmm. i mean i'd love to have shot the jordan buck but i wasn't there in 1914 uh you know so so he's off the list but among the deer that you have a chance to shoot, you know, you're going to, you know, like hit list and stuff like that. I'm not a big fan of saying, oh, he's my number one hit list buck or my, he's my, my number three target buck. I'm going to call him Joey or whatever. That's fine. Do what you want to do. But but I'm kind of like, hey, people say, what's a, what's a shooter to you? And I haven't killed this giant deer like some guys have, but I've killed a lot of mature deer. And I honestly say this, I say, look, when he comes out, if I want to shoot him, if I look at him and say, I want to shoot that deer, he's a shooter. That's, I don't even, I don't even say, oh, he's five and a half versus four and a half. Oh, he's, he's, he's 18 versus 19 or anything else. I, how many points? I said, no, he's just like, do I get the urge to shoot him? If I do, then that's a shooter. And I don't make it any more complicated than that. Now, people probably think we do because we, we get into measurements and rankings and scores and quibbling back and forth. But as a hunter, no, I just, if I like him, I shoot him. Yeah, I, I laugh at all the guys that say, you know, I only shoot five-year-old deer or older. <laughs> um, you hear things like that, and you think, man, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, we got we got deer around me that uh, constantly get shot, and they're positively aged at three and a half, and they make Boone and Crockett. And you tell me you're going to pass that deer because he's not five? You know, they're going to shoot him, and they're going to say he's five. <laughs> 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 well you know yeah there there uh there are so many there's so many ways to spin any of this stuff right i mean you know you tend to people kind of do what they want to do i mean i figured that out a long time ago is like they'll rationalize whatever it is in whatever way it makes sense to them that they think they can pass off right okay this is why i did this or this is why i didn't do that or this is what i would or wouldn't do well it's easy to say i wouldn't shoot this deer uh you know looking at him on trail camera but you're in a tree half frozen and it's late in the rut and he walks <laughs> underneath you hey you know it's two in the morning and miss america ain't coming in right i mean that's that's kind of that deal so all of a sudden he he looks a lot older and bigger than he did back in august when you're flipping through trail cam yeah for sure um, how, how did you guys find like rumors of all these bucks that were killed or, um, I guess, how'd you chase down those stories? Well, you know, as in the case with the Hanson buck, again, somebody, somebody out there called us and, yeah. uh, and we reacted right away as, as fast as you can react from Northern Georgia to Western Saskatchewan. Uh, but today, honestly, you know, a lot of people will email us at NorthAmericanWhitetail.com or go to our social media pages and say, hey, just shot this buck or my buddy, you know, killed this one last week or whatever. So you get tips that way. Your riders obviously are out there in the field and they they tend to have their eyes and ears open too. any more. Uh, I mean, part of me wishes we'd never invented the Internet because or social media, because I thought I think when you had a great network of finding big deer before now, anybody can find them. They just got to turn the phone on. Yeah. You know, it's like every five minutes there's somebody's got another giant, some other state, you know, for about a month or six week period right there. It's just like how many giants you want to look at? Well, you couldn't cover them all, even if you made postage stamp sized stories out of them in the magazine. You couldn't cover all the big deer these days. It was easier to do it back in the old days because there weren't as many of them. And frankly, there weren't as many people chasing them. So it, once one got killed, if it was a week or two weeks or, or two years sometimes before you found out about it, it was still virgin territory because nobody else had either. But today, I, if you don't know about him, it, I mean, some of these deer are still kicking in the back of the truck when these guys are measuring them and putting putting reels out there for social media and doing this, that, and the other and thanking all their sponsors, right? Well, that's just a different world than we grew up in. You know, you know there's one thing I really wanted to ask you about your opinion on, and that's uh, the Jordan buck. You know, every time I read mm -hmm. that story or hear that story, I wonder about 
you know, how did they authenticate whether that guy really shot that buck? As the there, story goes, he uh, shot it and lost it for many years. He took it to tax service and didn't get back for many years. And there was no photo or anything. Mm-hmm. And now he says it's his buck. And they, I know that uh, Boone and Crockett said they took a year to authenticate that. But I don't know. It just always puzzled me as to whether or not that's really his deer. Yeah, you know, some of those things like that. Um, there's other deer, those really old deer back in the days when uh, have, there were barely even any cameras, much less anybody trying to actually document this stuff. But um, they just kind of had, I think, took some of it on faith. I mean, I believe that's what it came down to. Uh, his story seemed to make sense. He seemed to be adamant about it. Nobody else was trying to claim it. And it just apparently... You know, I mean, they didn't DNA test it or test for minerals in the antlers to authenticate the location or anything like that, like they can do now with with investigations. But also, there wasn't the scrutiny back then either, Dan. You know, you remember that, hey, somebody was more likely to take you at your word for some of this because nobody had been trying to scam anybody. And so I I honestly do think it is almost certainly must be his deer. that said, I, I would agree with you. The forensic evidence is not strong. Yeah. You also didn't have a, a, a few million people on the internet uh, giving you theories on why they're right or why it's wrong, you know. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, when you say it like that, sure. I got I to gotta wonder, you could probably question just about any buck if you weren't there when the guy shot it. So, yeah. Well, you, you know, I've never been bored for it to, to a degree until they prove otherwise, I guess. Well, yeah, you know, and there's deer. You, you, everybody has to go through the process. I mean, if you if you want things to be authenticated, I mean, I can I can draw up a contract or whatever. It doesn't mean much if if a lawyer doesn't look at him, it doesn't get signed, notarized, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, otherwise, it's just a story, right? It's just something that you said. So, I would like to see. Um, you like to see consistency. That's the thing. I think you want to see consistency in how in how the rules are applied, the training for the measures. Um, the way everything is done. And that's as close as you can ever get to apples to apples in comparing some of these deer. Uh, the thing about it is it doesn't change. It doesn't change the deer. I mean, the deer is right. the deer, no matter what we call him. And we could call him number 27 or number 227 in the record book. And it's the same set of antlers. I mean, right. they're, they're two bones that grow out the top of the deer's head and the deer's dead. And he's not telling, you know, the story. And if the hunter comes out later and says, uh, well, you know, I lost him, but then I found him. And, you know, Wayne Zapped up in Alberta, get, people gave Wayne trouble because he shot this deer, took a couple of days to find him. You know, the coyotes were on him. I mean, he recovered part of it. I mean, they thought the deer was potentially bigger than Mel Johnson, but he, he got knocked down for an out of, out, of symmetry, out of line point on his right side. But people wanted to take pot shots. And in any little opening, people will, in fact, say, oh, ah, see, I'm the super detective and I have figured out what's really going on here in the guy's line so they can, I guess, feel better about themselves. I don't know what that accomplishes. Even if they're right, I'm not sure what it accomplishes, but very seldom do I think they're even right. So Yeah, it's even worse nowadays. you got haters everywhere. Everybody does. Yeah. Well, I said one time, I said, even years ago, I said, you know, if it's gotten to the point where if the Pope shot a Boone and Crockett, at noon on live TV in the middle of Yankee Stadium by dark tonight, somebody down at the bar would be calling him a poacher and said he didn't yeah. kill him. You know, there's people that say the sun didn't come up this morning too, right? I mean, there's there's always there's always a counterpoint out there, if, and you don't have to look very hard these days to find it, especially in the deer world. Uh, Gordon, did you get to uh, talk to Dustin Huff, uh, the guy that shot the Huff buck here in Indiana? You know, I didn't talk to Dustin directly at the time because I literally had I was in the process of, of, of retiring actually when yeah. it happened. And so I did try to help the guys at North American Whitetail, um, you know, kind of sort out the pieces on it. And boy, what a what a wonderful deer. I mean, just a spectacular animal. Yeah, it's so impressive how like it's just like a perfect like a just a box frame on it. I just it looks like a southern Indiana buck to me. Other than it's, you know, 50 inches bigger than most of the big ones around here, you know. <laughs> I was going to say, um, if that looks like a Southern Indiana buck to you, I need well, to come with you, yes. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, you know what I mean, though? They're just like that kind of chocolate uh, sure. boxy frame to them. 
Well, it's just um, a, it, it, it's just what the record book is meant to celebrate, which is just one of those, you know, deer like that are so normal, they're abnormal. You know, they yeah. don't really have anything really too much to dispute on them. They're just like, they're, they're just big and beautiful. And you just always hope that they get killed legal, fair and square, 100% legit. As far as I know, everything on that deer is legit. Yeah, yeah. He seems like a really nice guy, too, just from the things I've heard him talk about and the you know little he's been on the media. But um, the one thing that's amazing about all those big bucks is you can take these giant eight pointers and giant 10 pointers that have all made records and stuff. And not a one of them is identical. No, they, you can look at them all and you can recognize them. Yeah. It's amazing how even as eight pointers or 10 pointers and in a typical frame, you can still see one deer from the next. And it's just amazing how um, God created every one of them a little different. Even yeah, to this it, year, it is. All through history. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, people say, well, two, as I was talking earlier, say two, even two spikes are not 100% identical. If you looked at them close enough, long enough, you'd say, oh, here's the difference between them, right? And so um, it's just like, that's part of nature's artwork to me that makes makes deer special. I mean, I realize mountain goats are not identical either, but I don't hunt mountain goats. I mean, they all look the same to me. Uh, most of the sheep look the same to me. A walrus looks like a walrus, right? I mean, certain things, and a bear for sure, they all look the same to me. I I, I just don't, and turkeys that way too. I just don't, yeah. I'm not into that. But deer, to me, every one of them I see as an individual animal. And maybe that's why I feel like there's more of a connection to deer. But it's like, I kind of see that as more of a one-on-one -on -one thing, even if I'm not hunting an individual deer. I still see it more as that's, that's an adversary as opposed to just kind of a generic, you know, you've seen one dove, you've seen one mallard, you've seen them all, right? I mean, to me, some big game is almost like that. I mean, I look at elk and say some of them are ridiculously big, some of them are smaller, but they all kind of look like different sizes of the same deer or the same animal. And to me, that's not true at all with whitetails. I mean, they, they all look different. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, do you think the, the world record buck is walking around right now somewhere? Uh, easier to imagine a uh, typical and a non-typical, obviously, uh, just because the sheer amount of antler they have to grow. I mean, but, but we have seen like with the Minnesota monarch sheds in the late eighties, I mean, even up in the middle of nowhere, you can have one deer grow to be world record class that they, he just never got killed, but he was theoretically right about the same size as the, as the Missouri monarch, you know, three, three thirty something score. Um, it's easier to imagine a typical because he would have to grow quote only a little over 200 inches if he grew it perfectly. And that's a lot less yeah. than growing 350, right? Nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, there, when you start getting into frames that are, that are in excess of, let's say 212, 215, 220, uh, you get up into that in the high 20s and, and 230, which is as big as we've ever seen, really. 236, that uh, Tim Beck buck out of, at, from Fort Wayne a few years ago, he's got a 236 typical frame, mm -hmm. and he's a 305 not typical. I mean, he's just, they don't get any better than that. I mean, that's just as big as deer get. But um, it's easy for me to imagine a deer like that being clean and maybe beating Hanson. Maybe. But if you look back through history, it was in 1995. So this is two years after Milo shoots his deer. Uh, we're in Dallas at the Boone and Crockett Convention. It's just been officially awarded. He's gotten his award at the banquet. I mean, he's he's the man now. He's got two thirteen and five eighths official, totally the world record. Nobody's even going to question that. The Brian Damry buck was there. The Bruce Ewan buck was there. Those are both two hundred inch net typicals, and they were way down the list from Hanson at the same banquet. Okay, so that was a t that was a big time for big whitetail, uh, typical whitetails. But I told Milo at dinner that night. I said. I said, it's not going to last five years. He said, well, why did you say that? I said, well, there's just too many big deer out there now. I said, there weren't as many 100 years ago as there are now. I said, any day, I mean, cameras and lasers and you, all the stuff we have now, I said, and management, somebody, I just think somebody's going to break it. Well, that was, let's see, what is that, like 27 years ago that I was an idiot then? And I'm, st I'm still an idiot now, right? I mean, I, <laughs> nobody is... Nobody has broken it officially. I'll put it that way. You see any sheds that are close? 
uh, oh, you know, that OG buck out of uh, Southern Ohio a few years ago was maybe close. Uh, I don't think he was clean enough, but I think he would gross enough. Um, God, there was a deer killed uh, Southern Kentucky that, you know, was on the internet today. I mean, the retired game warden killed him. They have scored him, whether it will hold up or not, I don't know, but they scored him at 200 and I think three eighths net. But his gross typical, if score, as they scored him, was like 220 and six eighths. That's as big as Hanson, just not quite as clean. So, you know, I mean, he's unbalanced and all that, but he's, that's a deer out of a part of Kentucky that nobody's flocking to to kill giant deer every year like they are Saskatchewan or Alberta or Iowa. But nonetheless, it only takes one, right? It only takes that one special freak, you know, that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar kind of a, you know, short parents and then a kid grows to be seven foot four. And where did that come from? Well, that's the same way with deer. Just sometimes they just fall out of the sky and it only takes one of them to do what we're talking about. It's just that we keep holding our breath, waiting for that day. And I'm holding it after 27 years, I'm starting to turn blue. So, you know, I just don't <laughs> think I'm going to see it, but I'm not going to say that it can't happen. I just don't think I'll see it. Yeah. It's pretty unbelievable. Um, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I held that huff buck and I'm, I'm just like, you know, it's unbelievable how big those things are, you know, um, and if they get that big, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there's a, there's an old saying that among people that are really in the antler, in the antler side of things saying, well, this deer is big in hand. Okay. Big in hand is different from saying he looks yeah. big on a wall or it's look or they look like certain size in the magazine or whatever else. Cause you know, you can take wide angle shots. You can make a 140 look like a 180. I mean, you could do all kinds of trick stuff, but when you get them like this and you say, Whoa, he's more than I thought he was there, there. I've run into many deer like that, that the record book would not convey that. But boy, when you get them in your hands, you say, man, that's a deer. And, uh, I don't know how to score that. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Gordon, we were talking this morning and you said you, you got an article coming uh, out, um, kind of about what we were talking about earlier about kind of, uh, these old time bucks and, um, how the habitat may have had some uh, effects on some of these bucks. Could you touch on that a little bit? I thought that was real interesting. Yeah. The, the next issue of North American whitetail is coming out as kind of a habitat theme issue as we typically do this time of year, because everybody's, you know, deer season's closed and people are starting to think about next year. And a lot of people think about food plots and all these different things, you know, hinge cutting and all the stuff that people do. Right. So, I said, well, let's take it. Let's take a look back um, at some of these truly legendary bucks. And it, you know, the the Breen buck, the the Jordan buck, the Hole in the Horn, the Mel Johnson buck, like you talked about. But even the General Sheds out of Nebraska, the World Record typical Sheds, uh, the Dale Austin buck from the early '60s in Nebraska. You know, for for until Mike Beatty came along in 2000, that was the undisputed non-typical World Record with, with a bow. And all those deer legends and people say, well, gee, those all were killed or, or in the case of Hohenhorn, those all those all lived. It probably got hit by a train. But nonetheless, those deer were from long, long ago, way before anybody was managing habitat. So that just shows what pristine natural habitat can grow. Now, I'd be the last one to say that nature is wrong. However, I would also tell you that all of those deer were killed in altered habitats. You know, when Mel Johnson kills this deer in a bean field, that's different from saying that was prairie grass. Okay, he kills a two twelve, you know, a two twelve gross or whatever that deer was, two o four and four eighths net, uh, in a lush bean field in the middle of a lush part of the world like central Nebraska, uh, excuse me, central Illinois. Then you're saying, well, gee, that's kind of a giant food plot, and he wasn't the only one. There were food plots there all around. They just didn't call him that, you know, hole in the horn. Uh, he got, you know, got found dead between a train track and the arsenal fence in northeast ohio after they'd already chopped up all that country for 150 years and made it into small farms it wasn't it wasn't native woods like it was in 1800 when the first surveyors came through there the same with the jordan buck i've walked the jordan buck trail in northwestern wisconsin which you can do and the public can go walk that trail it's like a mile down through an old railroad track where jordan walked when he shot the deer again on the assumption dan that this is his deer, right? I mean, we're, we're mm -hmm. just assuming that, but, but I've walked is through there. Is that a marked trail that's a, that people publicly walk? Yeah, it's called the, the, the Jordan, it's called the Jordan Buck Heritage Hike. 
is what it's mm. called. And, and it and it's along the old Gandhi Dancer Trail leading up toward the river, uh, toward the Yellow River up into Danbury in Burnett County. So, you know, it's not that far out of the Twin Cities. It's, you know, it's, oh, it's not. Me. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a cool thing to go walk it and to imagine, hey, if I were James Jordan yeah. with my little 2520 carbine in 1914 on November 20th, walking through the snow and I hear a train whistle and a bug jumps up and I shoot him. And then I keep shooting at him and he finally falls dead in the river. Then I lose him. Then we go drag him out of the river. And then the taxidermist loses him for 50 years. And I'm an old man. And I say, this is my buck. I've got the world record. What a story, right? But I mean, that just to talk about the habitat part of it is just like that country was all cut over what, even before 1914. You know, that country is not virgin at the time. 1918 in northern Minnesota where the brain buck was killed near Bemidji, that country had been cut over for 30, 40, 50 years, some of it. So that was not walking into the true untouched wilderness and killing these dinosaur size megabucks, okay? All these deer were products of farming or logging or something that altered the habitat. It's just that we did not call it what we do today. Now it's timber stand improvement, right? You know, if you want to, to, to adjust your woods for better deer carrying capacity or winter or winter food or cover and stuff like that. Well, now, OK, yeah, we call it something. But back then they were just logging. OK, back then they were just farming. They weren't food plotting. They were just farming and they grew mega giant deer. So that's not to say nature couldn't have done that on her own. But when we look at those specific examples, I think we find time and again that there was a severely altered habitat in which those deer were killed. So, no, I mean, I, I just I just took a look at that and tried to try to make sense of it, because I don't think anybody had ever done that before on those particular deer in those particular areas. So I I just felt like that would help people understand that, you know, uh, virgin, quote unquote, virgin woods is not always going to be the best place to hunt. That brings up a good point about uh, something else real similar. I had a conversation years and years ago with an outfitter. He's long since died but he used to be a good friend of mine and i'd meet him at all the deer shows when i used to go and uh he'd be in a booth next to me and we'd talk and uh he was always trying to get me to go up by him and uh he told me dan if you want to come up with by me and hunt ask me first i'll let you know what year he says because we don't say this to the general public because we'll lose clients but on when we have a mild winter the next year our rack sizes are 20 percent bigger mm -hmm. And he says it's he says statistically every time. So you see something with those mild winters and in, in places that uh, maybe don't have as much food or or that are further north. Well, that's a good question because um, old timers in South Texas, and that's a totally different place from where you're talking about. But old timers in South Texas, and in, in that country is super dry sometimes, and it's super hot too and it's that way for months on end and you say that how do deer make a living here um even in a good year it's still kind of semi-desert but the old timers would tell you the best racks are going to be in the drought years now i don't know whether that was bet those were the best best racks or whether the deer were that much more huntable when they had less food and thus they ended up killing bigger deer. I'm not sure, you know, they were saying deer for deer that the deer is going to be bigger without food or without water. I mean, it's kind of hard to believe. But it also, right. in some of those places, the browse that does exist gets concentrated in terms of its nutritional value as opposed to places uh, cattlemen would tell you on the Gulf Coast. Uh, when my parents moved up in the Gulf Coast running cattle and moved 200 miles inland in Texas 60 years ago, they they found out real quick that even though there wasn't as much grass in in the Texas Hill Country, they they said it was quote stronger grass. It wasn't all water like the like some of the uh, the the grass pastures were down on the Gulf Coast where it was raining all the time and high humidity, and so it wasn't a quantity thing. There was so much more quality browse. So I'm not sure that doesn't factor in sometimes, but I would I would absolutely tell you that when deer get stressed, it can't help. I mean, it really, if, if you think about winter stress, um, particularly these days, you know, when you've had EHD die-offs and stuff and you've got wolves and you've got all kind of stuff going on that we may not even know about. I, CWD to me is kind of a joke. I don't even consider that a factor, but, but EHD is a factor. And if you get your deer numbers knocked way down, but then you get a mild winter, 
Well, then the deer that are left obviously have got tremendous amount of food. And that may, it may be fewer deer, but you may also have bigger top end. So I think every place and every situation is unique. I don't think we can absolutely say, okay, well, this is how it is, period, everywhere. Uh, but I would say that if your deer have serious winter stress, it cannot help the next year's rack. It's just no way. Kind of going back to um, what we were talking about, about how habitat affected deer back in the day is something else they had going for them way back then was they the deer had way more habitat than they do now. And probably because of that factor, they had less pressure, which you know, typically less stress produces, you know, better deer in it too, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've heard a hundred times people's hunting spots getting turned into housing addition. Um, so... Yeah, I've hunted some of those places too, and it's a sickening thing to have hunted a place and <clears throat> and to know it's good, and then to come back and look at it turned into, you know, ranchettes or whatever, and and say it'll never ever, you'll never hunt it again. I mean, that's whether it's a good place or not, uh, you yeah. feel that way. But when it's a really good place, and some of those places like that are. It is just a nauseating thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, nope. I don't even I don't even drive by those places anymore because I just have bad. You know, I want to have good feelings about them because they were great places to hunt. But sometimes you just it's like it's just too hard to look out across there and look at rooftops. You know. Yep. Yeah. I had it happen. I had it happen to me this year. Uh, I can look out my window of my house and see where I shot my buck in Indiana this year. And um, about a month ago, I noticed there was a bulldozer out there. And then uh, within a couple of days, they they pushed all the trees in, and now it's just a pile of ashes out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I now. mean, pe people have to have a place to live, but they don't have to live in the good deer spots, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Yeah, this is this is essentially just a farmer that there was trees there, oh, so well. he pushed them over. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it is what it is. It's all right. Yeah. Um, well, we've been on here for about an hour. Let's let's take a couple questions, Gordon. Um, sure. Gary, he asked you, what is your favorite deer story of one you shot? Of what I shot, um, now, when you've been around as long as I have and you've hunted, tried to hunt a little bit here and there, you know, you've shot a lot of deer, right? So I don't mean to demean any other deer by saying this because I've shot some deer that were much bigger than my favorite deer. Um, my favorite deer, now a lot of guys might say, well, my favorite deer is my first deer. Well, in my case, that's a fond memory, but, you know, I I have to go forward a few more years. When I was 13, in the fall of 1969, uh, I had been hunting more or less with adult supervision. Not that you had to in Texas at that time. You didn't have to have any adult. You could just go hunt. But I had always kind of hunted with family. But that fall, and I was starting to bow hunt a little bit, and that fall, I went back to this oat field behind our house in the Texas Hill Country, and I saw this really big buck in late October. And the uh, biggest buck I had ever seen on the hoof. I mean, I hadn't seen many of them, period, that were bigger than that. And I thought, golly, that's, you know, I've got to kill that buck. I mean, I just, I could not imagine. It was a buck of a lifetime, right? Now, from late October, I hunted that deer pretty religiously. It was kind of like every day after school, more kind of a thing. But I could get out, I could go back there in the afternoon and try to hunt. So I hunted him a little bit with a bow. Then gun season came in. So then I started gun hunting in early November. And it still took another month. So it took me about six weeks, but I finally killed this deer. And he was by, you know, he was a good deer for that area especially back then nobody was protein nobody was genetics or anything in texas at the time they were just regular wild deer and so probably a mid 120s kind of a 11 pointer uh but he was the deer i was trying to kill and i have often told uh, the good lord just let me have him i mean i don't know why but he just he just said look i'm gonna let you kill this deer and that kind of lit a fire under me as you can imagine because not many kids i was going to school with uh, some of them hunted but nobody killed a buck that big so it's not like i you know it was a parade in town or anything like that but i was seriously proud of that deer and i still am today when people say well you know what's your best deer uh, to me best and biggest are not always the same thing you know, he's a long way from the biggest, but he's absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, still in some ways my best. I, I would say, you know, they don't get any more special to me than a deer like that. 
And um, so it isn't some big bow kill or some, you know, exotic thing. It was behind the house as a 13 year old kid shooting an old Remington six millimeter that jammed half the time that I've tried to shoot it, you know, but it, but it didn't, it didn't jam that day. And I got it, we got it done, you know, so uh, I was, I was super proud then. I'm super proud now. And that's been 50, what, 53, 54 years ago. That's a good story. Um, someone, I'm, I apologize. I can't find the comment now. I read it a second ago and I've lost it, but someone was asking about the general and kind of what the story is of that buck. Mm-hmm. Well, you have to go back to 1959 um, to the actual time when the buck drops the sheds. Now, the buck was never killed in Nebraska. Uh, this is in Custer County, Nebraska, near Broken Bow. Uh, on a ranch, um, there's a lot of small grain farming, a lot of alfalfa farming there. In fact, even at the time, I mentioned this in this article I have coming up, that Custer County, Nebraska was, in all the whole state of Nebraska, it was the number one alfalfa county. Uh, in the whole state at that time. And we all know alfalfa is just not only a deer magnet, but it grows deer like crazy. I mean, it's just a great deer plant. So I don't know if there was alfalfa right where this deer was found, but the the rancher was out looking for a lost calf in the brush and he found these two sheds. Uh, He said apparently, apparently he had seen three bucks together before then. And he said the other two were, quote, just as big. Now, Dan, how many times you heard this one, right? Oh, I shot this one. The other one was bigger. Okay, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, Not saying it can't happen, but it doesn't happen very often. So anyway, bottom line, the guy doesn't know what he has. He takes them back, sticks them in an old bunkhouse on his ranch. In the mid 90s, Tim Condick, who is a an outfitter from Oklahoma, Tim is looking to lease some ground in that area. So Tim happens to knock on the right door. He says something about antlers or bucks they've killed or whatever. The guy takes him in a room, shows him these sheds, and Tim almost falls out because Tim knows what they are. So Tim ends up with them. Uh, They ended up, uh, you know, they changed hands multiple times since then. But the deer, spin sheds, of course, you can't can't establish a a perfect inside spread, so you can't say what the deer 100% scored. But I don't think there's any way, there's no way this deer scored under 217 net, typical. He could have scored 218, 219. Uh, You know, he grosses like high 220s. Um, He's just a ridiculously big deer, and he looks big. I mean, you know, he doesn't just score big. He looks big, as you can see in those photos. And so that is the story, really, of that deer. Uh, Again, to our knowledge, nobody ever shot at the deer, was hunting the deer, you know, killed him or anything later. We just don't have any any knowledge of that. But Nebraska had barely even opened its deer seasons back in those days. That and now again, that was about the time it was two or three years later that Dell Austin killed his 279 world record non-typical with a bow, and that was 75 miles down southeast of there. So it was a time when some giants were roaming those those sand hills and river bottoms out there, and and that's basically. You know, that's about as big as deer get. I mean, they oh. they might get bigger than that, Dan, but they don't need to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this, is, this is the general, correct? Yeah, that Gordon? is the general. Okay, okay, general, making yes. sure. Yeah. Um, I thought it was. I, I knew what Bucky was talking about, but uh, yeah, that deer almost, and see, like we were talking about earlier, you can just, that as soon as you see that book, like I had in my mind that that was the general, and, you know, he, he's different. He looks, he kind of looks sprawled out and just different looking rack. Every, well, and he's a five by six, correct? I, I believe that's the case. And look how uneven his G2s are. And, you know, yeah. he's, so, he's so staggered on his time length. He gets killed on net. Like I say, it's moot anyway, but he is the world record in the North American Shed Hunters Club, the world record typical set of antlers. So to me, whether we call him a world record or not, I mean, it, what we call deer doesn't change what they are. Anybody can look at yeah. those two antlers and say that's about as good as it's ever going to get. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, Gordon, we've been on here for well over an hour now. I don't want to take any more of your, your time, but, uh, you, uh, we had many comments about how people just love listening to you talk. And I know you, you recently were awarded the, uh, outdoor communicator of the year into 2021. Uh, Much deserved. yeah, I think that that's a, a compliment people are giving you. Um, well, we, 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 believe me, uh, 
when I accepted that award and, and, and actually we were at, at Bass Pro Shops in Springfield, Missouri, when we at that ceremony. And when I accepted the award, uh, the award, I said, on behalf of everyone at North American Whitetail, whether it's somebody there now, somebody that was there 40 years ago, uh, somebody that worked out of sight, you know, behind the scenes, the writers, the photographers, everybody, it's, you know, it, it is an award so much really for me individually. I, I couldn't have done any of it without those people. And, and the brand itself is such a strong brand. And <clears throat> to me, it's like, um, you know, you look at it now and you say, well, it's been around for 40 years, you know, it, it's, it, or Bowhunter magazine around for 50 years and, and Guns and Ammo. Some of these magazines have been around a long time. They're now specialty magazines and they've become iconic, but they couldn't have done it without the people that put them together, the people that contributed, obviously the, the people that sold the ads. I mean, the people that it ran the printing press. I mean, everybody, and certainly without the readers and viewers, uh, you know, you don't have anything anyway. I mean, you know, you could say, well, this is a great magazine. This is a great book. This is a great TV show or whatever, but the public will decide. And we've been blessed that the public has, uh, ha ha has responded and has supported us all the way through it. And, and hopefully that continues for way after I'm gone. But, uh, but it is really on behalf of North American Whitetail that, that all these things, um, the thanks have to be given. Awesome. Well, I, I uh, made sure in the description, I linked the, uh, linked everybody to go over to the North American Whitetail. Um, you guys still have, uh, sounds like a pretty prevalent, um, magazine subscription. You were telling me, uh, earlier today too. So if you, if you aren't subscribed, make sure you go over there and get you a subscription. Yeah, we appreciate a lot of stuff we do now, of course, is on NorthAmericanWhitetail.com, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of interaction between the two and, uh, and of course, television as well. So we just, yep. uh, however people find us and watch us or read us or use us, that's, uh, that's all good with us. We appreciate yep. it. I tried to link all that in the description for everybody. Um, everybody, thanks for hopping on tonight. I hope you enjoyed this one. Make sure you hit the like button if you, if you liked it and subscribe. Everybody, we'll see you. Well, I'll, I'll see some of you probably this weekend in the, at the workshops. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Bye, everybody. See Take ya. care.